So, Lucas, giving you a little background about disruptive technology, disruptive thinking. Um, I'd like to continue his stories uh, at the very end by telling you stories from my life, stories from Foursquare's life, and how we benefited from thinking disruptively. The um, story of Foursquare actually starts a long, long time ago. So both Dennis and I had been working and thinking about this space, that is to say the local discovery, the local travel space, um, for many years, for almost six or seven years now. Um, so the so story actually starts in the earlier mid-2000s. Um, I'd been working in mobile since about 2001. I actually started in music. I was trying to bring music to phones um, and thinking about how we could sell music over phones. How, how do we make this better, this commerce over phones better? Because we knew that we were going to be carrying around and walking around with our phones all the time. And we knew that um, we'd want access to the latest music. When we're talking with our friends, when we're out, we'd want to um, get the song immediately and start listening to it. So I started building something like that. Um, and then when I left music, um, and around that time, I was traveling a lot. And the way travel worked back then was, this was before um, you know, we had 3G data everywhere. Um, so the way travel worked was we'd go buy a travel book. We'd go buy like a Lonely Planet or a Fromers. Um, I'd have a, a notebook where I'd um, jot down notes from my friends. Um, I'd draw little maps for myself. You know, all the major streets and avenues would be highlighted on the map. And I'd take little notes for you know, li little streets that I wanted to go and explore. Um, but it was not a really good way to do it because I could draw as much as I wanted, but I wouldn't be able to share it very easily. If I went to a foreign country where the language is really different, then the map wouldn't make much sense. Um, and things change over the, you know, over the course of uh, uh, months. New places will pop up. Um, the way people see the world, the way people describe their city or the, the hotspots in a city will change. So my maps would you know, get, out of, get out of date. Um, and around that time, I started thinking a lot about mobile, and I wanted to really go and start something new in mobile, and I wanted to start something to, um, as Luke says, not really to, uh, to, to solve an existing pro to solve a problem, um, and to do it in a way that um, was very portable, was very mobile, because we're carrying on a very powerful device in our pockets, this phone, but all we were using it for at the time was um, to make phone calls and to uh, send texts back and forth with each other. Um, so we decided to you know, start hacking towards this problem. We created a lot of different tools. One tool would keep track of all the to-dos, all the things that we wanted to do in a city. Another tool would keep track of maps, would basically pinpoint all the different ways to, different things that we wanted to try in a city. Another actually had a set of tips, so recommendations and things and notes that my friends had left me and that wanted me to go see and find. And we actually called them post-its. We imagined them as, uh, as kind of like these little notes that your friends would leave and virtually stick onto walls so that as you walked by them, you would see them. Um, and that's, that's where the genesis of Foursquare really began. Um, the second thing that happened, uh, happened in 2007. And this is something that I want to call right now the iPhone or Android era. So before um, iPhone came out, and it came out in June of 2007, Android with their first phone probably a little bit later than that, um, we had many different phones, many different uh, marketplaces, many different places to buy apps, many different types of handsets, uh, some were color, some were black and white, some had GPS, some didn't, um, and it was just all over the place. So in order to actually go create an application to actually do something useful, to actually make this phone do something beyond just email and phone calls and text, uh, it was a very expensive, very complicated, convoluted process. You had to go build for every single one of those platforms, you had to test on every single one of those platforms, you had to make deals with carriers, you had to get on carrier decks. Um, you have to spend a lot of money. And as an independent developer, this is a very hard thing to do. Not only did you have to do all of these things, but every time you wanted to design something for a new phone that came out, you'd have to go through that entire process again. Design, pay for someone to design it or do it yourself, test it, launch it, market it. And what iPhone and Android did was that they set up a very democratic app store. And they opened up their SDK so that anyone could come and design and build and then put it into the app store. So everyone in the room, very much like we're all empowered to go create web pages and personal websites anytime we want to, have been empowered for very, very little cost to go and design our own iPhone apps. Um, and then they did something even more powerful and something that meant a lot for us is that they took that same kind of democratic approach to things like GPS and all the other sensors that are actually available on the phone that would be useful to us. Um, 
in the pre-iPhone era, what you had to do was probably make deals with a few carriers. You probably had to pay them directly as an app developer in order to actually get access to GPS. And many phones actually didn't have the chip in them, so they would never be able to locate where you are. But what these phones did was that they kind of eliminated that. So they thought about all the ways that the old carrier, old kind of model was broken, and they just came in and said, let's just start over. Let's just set the platform right here and then allow other people to go build interesting things. So the carriers, you guys can go do all sorts of crazy things about you know, uh, data speeds and putting up cell towers and all this stuff, but stay out of the app garden where we know what we're doing. We're going to give you this platform so people can go do all this new disruptive kind of technology. Um, and the last part um, really started in 2009 when we launched Foursquare. When we launched Foursquare, there were many, many, many different players in the space. So you had your traditional kind of guidebooks and uh, your physical things, like your Lonely Planets and many different websites, many different blogs that would tell you how to go see the world and what your favorite spots are and what people recommend. You also had a lot of different apps in the, in the marketplace, you know, Looped and uh, Google had a couple of different location applications. Um, and there were a lot of people that were trying to do something interesting. They were trying to, you know, get people to check in. They were trying to do something interesting with sharing tips and reviews and recommendations. Uh, you know, City Search and Yelp and all of these other sites. Um, so when we came around, we had to really think about the space differently. We had to approach it from a totally different angle. We had to prove to people that it wasn't just about the idea of checking in, right? It's about the data and all the value that actually comes out of it. No one, was, no one else was really proving that model. No one was actually proving why you're actually doing this. So we decided, why don't we give them reasons to actually go do this? Why don't we make it very playful and very fun and give them um, kind of the right data points and the right kind of visual model of why this is useful, why is this valuable to you in the future? And that's, that's kind of the vision and the approach that we took when we first launched. Um, and you see this in many different ways in Foursquare. So Foursquare at the very basic level is the idea of you know, checking in Announcing to your friends where you are. Um, it's about sharing tips and recommendations. Um, and people do this for many different reasons. They do it to meet up with their friends. They do it to meet other people with similar interests that are in the same space. They do it to keep a log or a diary of all the places that they've ever been. And over time, this gets more and more valuable. So once you first, when you first start up, you have a few data points and you're not sure, you know, is this service valuable or not? But then when you have a few hundred data points, actually, a few hundred check-ins in the system, then you realize, wait, it knows about everything that I ever did in Momo. It's going to know about everything that I did in Copenhagen. It's going to have this very virtual log, this diary, that I can keep with me forever and ever. Um, people use it to share as a status update, so very much like a Facebook or Twitter. You know, in the early days, you were wondering, why would I tweet? Why would I send a you know, Facebook, uh, post something on Facebook? Um, and in a very similar way, people were wondering, why do you check in? Um, but it's to share the status. It's to share your life and to give other people a view into what you're doing. Um, and then finally, to you know, get insight and recommendations. So this idea of tips um, and photos and all these other things that you can get back from the community, both from your friends as well as the rest of the, the, rest of the users. So over the last two years, we've grown to over 10 million users. Um, and over the last two years, this is one of my favorite maps ever, um, we've grown to more than 600 million such data points, 600 million check-ins all around the world. And then we've been able to do, uh, derive interesting data points from this, right? We've been able to plot them over the course of a day, so from 4 a.m. To, to 4 a.m. And you get to see when do people actually check in, what do they most check into, and what times of the day do we actually do that. We've been able to do interesting things like taking all those data points, all those check-ins, and then seeing something um, like just show me movie theater check-ins, and then plotting them against popular movies that came out. So you can see around Christmas, um, a lot more people went to the movies. You can see when Harry Potter came out, that was one of our highest days for movie theater check-ins. So it's really interesting to take this ambient data, this virtual data uh, from your phone, and then apply it to what's actually going on in real life. Apply it to going on, what's going on um, in movies or in music or how a city is actually behaving. And then we can show you all sorts of popular places in the neighborhood. So what's trending in your neighborhood? What's actually happening? So when you take out your phone, you're aware that there's actually a festival going on outside. And here are the places to check out in the festival, because they actually give you that deep dive into it, even before you go there. And then we turn around and cut it up into personal ways. So you see kind of like this Google Analytics view of your own personal life. Um, and then you can overlay it onto your calendar and see some of the same stuff. You know, you, s you set up a meeting at 2 p.m., but you always you know, you get to see interesting insights like, I set up a meeting at 8, I got there 20 minutes earlier. I set up a meeting over there at 2, I got there 40 minutes early. 
you see when you're early and when you're late. It gives you kind of like this awareness of where are you in life, and it kind of gives you this check of how am I actually performing as to where I'm supposed to be. Um, and then, you know, we make it very playful because uh, playful experiences are memorable and they're, they're fun and they're easy to talk about with your friends. Um, so it's very visual and the badges and the points are mainly meant so that you can show it off to your friends and that spreads the story and your story to your friends in a very viral way. Um, and one of my most favorite features is that we also keep track of who you're out with so that when you look back on this data many years from now or even a few months from now, you can actually see where was I and what was I doing there. Um, and when you aggregate all this data and you, and you look at it just overall in the entire population or just your own data, this is my own data overlaid on the map of New York, you get an insight into what are you really like in real life? What are the places that you like? Where do you go? Um, where do you overlap with other people? And what are the places that you haven't discovered? Where do you want to go? Where should you be? Uh, what are the things you're missing out on? Um, and how can you make your life better? Um, and, uh, you know, that's... That's the insight we've been able to derive, and that's, that's what we're working towards. So email me if you have any other questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry.